the human experience. Inside the humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu As we know from our experiences in IHUM, IHUM adopted a toolkit approach from the beginning to the development of students' critical skills, and postdocs are the ones responsible for teaching and developing those skills through discussion sections. And I will just leave to you to recall what that's about rather than going through it since most of you have good memories about it. During the past decade, however, what's changed about um, the toolkit approach is that advances in psychological and cognitive neuroscience research have begun to supply some explanations for why some of the best practices that we have developed over the years actually work. That is, why students do learn more effectively in some set settings and more un a better understanding of how we learn. What I'm going to do is provide a very brief update on how we've incorporated some of those research finding into our recent postdoc fellowship orientation and training. And I'll emphasize especially building habits of metacognition, which is what we, one of the areas we've been focusing on. My colleague, Mariette Denman, who many of you taught with and many of you have worked with from the Center of Teaching and Learning, will talk more about the humanities' potential for contributing to uh, the di public discourse about learning. So let me very briefly talk about how surprised I am every year, how little formal preparation our fellows have for coming into the fellowship. And that uh, in almost every case, fellows come in and it bring one of, to our attention something about how did they ever manage to teach a successful class in the past, as no one ever really knew why one pedagogical approach or another would work better. So I'm going to take us through very briefly an evolution of the fellowship in terms of thinking about how we teach about learning. And I'll acknowledge my colleague, Sherry Ross, who is here. Uh, under her leadership, IHUM did establish the sense of a peer community in a mutually supportive environment, encouraging and facilitating the possibilities for honest exploration of effective teaching strategies in an environment that was non-competitive. And of course, we know that we weren't, comp we, you, all of us were in such different fields that it was not a, a competitive environment in terms of where we were heading. So the, we were able to honestly assess each other and support each other and act as coaches for each other in relation to teaching. And this ownership of responsibility for teaching really resulted in some um, orientation sessions that I know many of you helped design for each other over the years. I don't know if Hella's still here, but I certainly remember some of the sessions she led when I first got affiliated with IHUM. When I first got involved in IHUM about six years ago as associate director taking from, over from Sherry, uh, I wanted to learn a little more about the fellowship, and so I held cohort discussion groups. That is, year one, I asked, well, what characterized each your year, year two? and what did you learn this year, year three? What, what's going on? And I did this uh, to you in a way both for me to learn my job, I wanted to learn from the experts, but also to try to get a sense of what it is to uh, design a fellowship explicitly with goals for each year of the fellowship, given what we've learned about learning and the desirability of setting objectives to which we could then design uh, particular strategies for achieving. If you know what you're supposed to be doing, you're much more likely to be able to achieve what it is you are um, expected to learn. So I will talk a little bit about the goals for the first year of the fellowship that evolved from uh, the first 10 years where the mutual exchange of uh, peer coaching led especially to uh, 
acknowledgement that the first year is a time for expanding your range of teaching strategies. That is the one thing in common to all first year fellows experience. And in teaching courses outside your discipline, you are learning how to approach texts in ways you were not trained as a graduate student to think about. In focusing on this as the past experience, I flipped it and turned it into the explicit goal of the first year fellowship. And so one of the ways we have done that is to emphasize certain skills, and in this case, the metacognitive skill in the learning process. And that is learning as a fellow, not necessarily, and we of course this refer, refers back to learning, helping students learn. But as a part of the fellowship, the emphasis is then on making fellows aware of the choices that every fellow is making in setting up a discussion, evaluating students, and therefore be aware that they're learning new ways to teach. This uh, metacognition then reinforces the learning process, and we have found that by, just by identifying it, fellows are indeed more um, transparently developing their, their teaching skills. So if you break down the process very quick, you know what you're expected to learn, then you know that your pedagogical instruction aims toward achieving that goal, finally, you're expected actively to try out and practice the different approaches for the sake of evaluating what works best for you. This, of course, applies to students as well, but this is one of the things we, are, we explicitly discuss for the first year of our fellowship. So over the past couple of years, I'm skipping here because we're out of time, the, um, structure of our workshops has acknowledged a year-long theme to learning about teaching. And we try to, of course, vary the themes each year so that by the time you've completed three years, we're not repeating ourselves. Maybe by the fourth year, we can. And that, that allows all the fellows in some ways to figure out we're explaining why we made the choices of strategies that relate to different challenges. Here's some of the topics. Reading skills. How do students read differently for different purposes? How do they read for close reading, active reading, skimming, selected reading? Something that we take for granted that we know how to teach, but by teasing it out and making it explicit, and then the exchange of best practice strategies that each fellow experiences is, is approached in the context of a progressive in, uh, environment across the year. Similarly, uh, paper comments. How do you write paper comments that students can learn something from them? A best practice that many people have discovered, but how do students learn from them then becomes part of the conversation of how, why you are expanding your teaching strategies. So there's a relationship between how you teach and how you learn. So just to sum up where we are now, we've built on this tradition of peer exchange of teaching practices as we try to bring new knowledge about teaching and learning into the fellowship. In particular, and the one thing that's been true, whether it was um, from the entire 15 years or 14 years, you certainly have time to practice your teaching strategies. I counted it up as something like 400 hours over three years that you are in a classroom, in a seminar, in a discussion, where you can develop mastery of many effective te teaching techniques. So in particular, one of the things I wanted to mention is I've seen fellows start in the fellowship making a conscious effort to remember to ask themselves a question. What do I want students to learn through discussion today? Which is, sometimes you have to ask yourself, that's what that's going to be. But by the end of the fellowship, this conscious effort has just become a habit of thought. It feels natural. And the practice of paying attention to student learning is just incorporated into the, the uh, postdoctoral fellowship 
and from what I've heard uh, up till about teaching after, after the fellowship, that habit of thought, regardless of whether it's um, a, through a metacognitive pro process or otherwise, has paid off in terms of the ways in which our fellows are, te fellows are teaching throughout the country today. Now I'm going to turn to Mariad, who's going to talk a little bit more about the content of our learning. All right, thank you. Um, Alan, so I survived IOM. I was <laughs> the first uh, generation together with Sherry. I'm so glad to see her, who got us all going and engaged in, in a wonderful conversation about teaching, about our subjects. I think what I took out of IOM is also kind of, that was the first time I actually witnessed how you can bring your enthusiasm for your content together with um, intentional planning of skills building, kind of this combination and make this work in the classroom. That was really, really crucial, at least for my understanding as a practitioner, what I'm, I'm doing as a practitioner um, in the classroom with my students. And the other thing I pulled out of it was this conversation with my peers, not just about content, but actually the realization that different disciplines really approach uh, teaching differently because they practice their field differently. So there's this connection between how you practice, or how you think about things, um, and how you teach. It's pretty, there's a, there's a nice connection there. Um, and finally, I also became more aware of how do you teach kids who don't want to be here? <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is one of the challenges with IHAM. Now, we've talked, I've heard the conversations before, it's like, how do you make a case for yourself as a practitioner of the humanities in a world where people think it's actually not important? Or they only want to engage with you when you're on a popular TV show? Um, or in a good case scenario, when you produce a textbook, which is really a manifestation of our practices uh, and put together in a very um, thoughtful way. But every good textbook, of course, engages the learner very actively uh, and, and kind of creates that choreography of learning uh, that combines what we do, uh, combines the content with the skills. I mean, there's this kind of uh, painless experience then of learning in a way, right? So, so that was one thing certainly that started for me when I, I came to IHAM. Then I left IHAM and jumped into um, you know, faculty shoes and had a good time there left those behind and came back to the Center for Teaching and Learning. And one thing that really, um, the reason why I'm still here is the, the fascination about learning um, in two ways. One is how do we as practitioners in our field, but also practitioners in the classroom, how do we continue to learn? How do we continue to expand not just the skill set, but our thinking about learning? And how do we plug in, actually, into research on learning? Now, as a former faculty member, I know exactly how you know, I time manage my time. And that plugging into the research of learning, I just didn't have the time for it. So there, there are a lot of pressures around it to, to kind of not pay attention to this. Uh, since I've come to CTL, I, I just, I, I mean, I love learning. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm, I find it fascinating to now pay attention to that other side, what's going on in the research. Because there is research out there. There is data out there. Carlos has made that point. And actually engaging with that data will benefit your own learning uh, as well as your students. Because if, once we start to ask ourselves, how do students learn? And there's so much like educational psychology. Uh, we can turn to the School of Ed. They produce wonderful uh, research on it. And yes, K through 12 actually may apply to us too because these kids come from K through 12 when they come to us. So we would actually benefit listening to our colleagues who prepare the kids that we are going to work with. Um, so bringing, focusing on it and has not just, will not just benefit you, uh, but it will benefit the students. And I would actually make a point, it will benefit us as a field. Because what, how can we contribute to the, I mean, that's the title, right? Teaching the uh, humanities for the 21st uh, century. 
is I would make a pitch that once we start to pay attention to learning, that will change our thinking about teaching. And we cannot avoid the question, namely, what do we do in our classes? What kind of thinking do our students practice in our class? And I don't mean you know, pulling out, let's say, critical thinking as an isolated skill. You know, sometimes you have the literature of study skills. Well, we know this is kind of hard to do in isolation of a skill because there has to be a purpose to it. There has to be a motivation to it. They, when we practice, we don't just isolate a skill. It's in a dialogue with the very particular research we do or the very particular field, a uh, very particular audience that we kind of are in the act of practicing our field. Now, how can we make that more interesting for our students? That's then the question that I'm trying to, to um, think just a little bit. And actually what I want to do, or what I'm hoping I'm going to do is jumpstart a conversation over lunchtime, namely the question, how have you developed your own teaching and learning about learning and teaching since you've left IHAM? And how would you describe how learning works in your classroom? And, and what you do? that to foster that kind of learning or uh, the practice of your field in your classroom because I think there are a lot of interesting projects out there that, that we will, uh, that you can help each other, you know, inspire each other and bring home some good ideas. So going back to research, as I said, it's kind of hard to do when you're in the middle of trying to publish and, and do all the other things. But I'm just going to give you one example that I thought was actually interesting. So we always say we, we practice critical reading. But we know we, we enjoy this. Uh, we like that. We derive pleasure in the sense of competency from it. Now, when I talk with students during mid-quarter evaluations about reading, um, they often say under the third question, what can you do better to in help yourself learn better or more and help your, help your colleagues uh, be better learners? They often say, do the reading. <laughs> so here's this kind of contrast, right? Well, we, we, that's never a question for us. We always do the reading. And the students <laughs> kind of feel they have to do the reading. So what I find <coughs> about this comment that they say is actually interesting because you can look at it from two perspectives. One, uh, reading becomes a task they have to check off. But on the other hand, when I then poke them, I said, why don't you do the reading? They, attract, they kind of talk about the frustration, why they feel they can't do the reading. And doing reading is actually not a misnomer. We, reading is a particular activity. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. And what turns out where the students are having a hard time is they don't really know how their professors are reading. They don't know what reading is. They understand that they're running maybe against a wall and they can't read all the facts because they kind of think reading is picking up information or reading is reading for pleasure. And, and those kind of models don't work when, when they come to our class. But then they're kind of sitting there guessing what reading actually is, what kind of activity is this. And so hence, I need to do the reading but I don't really know how, and because then I have an engineering project is due, and I'm producing a really exciting product, and I'm, guess what, how I'm going to time manage my time. I'm just not going to do it, because who knows that I haven't done it anyway. <laughs> so, so the question then is, comes up, what do we know about how students read? And I want to bring, just kind of highlight one little, one article and that uh, brings up really good uh, ideas and questions about this. And it was an article that I found in, where is it now? Oh gosh. By, by Weller, uh, Professor Weller. And now of course I have my, lost my things. Oh, here, Serene Weller, comparing lecture and student accounts of reading in the humanities. And it was published in, uh, in the journal Arts and Humanities in Higher Education. That's actually a pretty good place where you have the scholarship of learning and teaching in the humanities come up. So she then dug in and said, like, okay, what's happening here? And 
how do lecturers read? And that comes out of Britain, so that's why she calls everyone a lecturer. And how do the students read? And she set up a set of interviews. So it's a qualitative study, uh, uh, meaning you really kind of dig in into the process of how people think through interviews. And what she found, and probably you're not surprised to hear that, what instructors do and think they're doing and think that's obvious what they're doing is not what students are doing. They, they actually seem to be living on two planets. But they're not necessarily aware that they're not in the same place. Uh, so instructors, of course, and I probably I thought, yeah, of course we do this, right? We conceptualize reading as a creative and intertextual process. We also are very happy to defamiliarize our own position in the world. I mean, there's, there's, of course, there is alienation happening. We take one position compared to another. It's not just that that position is me, that there's a whole intellectual process. We're very comfortable with uncertainty, ambivalence, conflicting perspectives, and think that's actually part of the process of our practice. Then she also asked about close reading in particular, because that's what we often do. And she noticed that the students of a, that we think when we do it, yes, we find the patterns, but what we do, we connect it. We make a lot of connections with other knowledge that we have, of course, because we have this enormous knowledge base behind us against which we practice close reading. Um, how do students read, on the other hand? Well, you can kind of guess, probably, or have seen it in part in action. They bring in their reading experience from other places. And now knowing that in other disciplines, another kind of thinking is happening, that also means another kind of reading is happening. The students are a little bit confused. Because how do you read in one discipline is not what you do in another. But they also come in with expectations, like I'm only reading for information, or I'm only reading for data pieces. Or it actually matters where they read. They read in bed before they go to sleep, or they read out there, they read, so the, 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 they call it the domestication of reading, that we, of course, we see it as a very professional act, but they kind of negotiate that at themselves as a reader, uh, because it happens in different places, in different situations. Critical reading, they're fully aware there should be critical reading, and they actually think, I am critical reading because I can identify different points of view. Yes, there's an angle here, and there's an angle here, and there's an angle here. And you have a point, you have a point, you have a point, and everybody has their point. <laughs> but what they can't do is connect them, kind of create a dense network of connections between a contextual setting, cultural setting, what these different points do, which actually maps quite well on what we know how novice learners learn. Yeah. I mean, that comes from a very different area now. Um, where the research confirms that. And finally, what do they do with close reading? Well, we're very happy to hear that, yes, they're pretty good at it. In ident again, picking out pieces, picking, identifying pieces. So we could say, OK, they learned, right? That there's progress in learning. They can do it. But again, they're having a really hard time making these connections to the larger framework. And when the readings that they do do contradict with what they believe, then there's a problem there because they read for familiar things. They don't want to defamiliarize. I mean, we've seen this, too, acted out. So what is so interesting about this study is that she's actually asking the students, how are you doing this? How are you processing this? What are your assumptions behind it? And she then proposes, so what can we do in a classroom, is to pay more attention on how learning happens with our students. We often don't know that. We look at the paper, we kind of hear what they say in conversation. But this next step to bring it to a higher metacognitive level, as you said, that you're trying to do with IHAM fellows, that will also help our students much more Not in two ways. One of them is you then have a way that they can think about who they are, where they're coming from, what shapes the way, you know, how they perceive the world and what shapes that. But also as a learner, and we know that if they become more self-directed, they will be more engaged and more motivated. And they can also be held more accountable for what they're learning. And for you, as an instructor, it's actually pretty good to know how, how they, wh what they're doing with the material, how. Because if you want to engage them as a practitioner, you need to be aware what the processes are behind it. 
right? So it's much easier then to, to um, talk, you know, push, push this further and talk about practice and what we do. So, uh, but as a lot of these research studies are, they always say, well, we cannot really draw final conclusions. We have to do more research. And um, she dipped in uh, into another article, which I thought actually was really interesting too, by saying, well, maybe we need to think about our own pedagogical strategies. So instead of doing the typical one, right, you decide what book to read, you give them background reading, you pose a question, you let them write a paper. That's for literary studies. Why don't we look at um, other fields where they train practitioners? Let's say medical education. Let's say nursing education. Let's say other places where you know, turning students into practitioners is a real mission of the whole game. And actually, yes, it is true. Medical education is a lot, doing a lot of really interesting pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And so another article, uh, also in that journal by Bill Hutchins and Karen Rook, do that. They ask, you know, in what ways can problem-based uh, learning be a model for literature courses? And what they say is, well, think for a moment. Start with your own principles of your practice. Or in, they, in that case, they talked about scholarship, but I would broaden this a little more. Right? If you write a textbook, that's your practice. Um, so think about the principles. Could you talk about those? Can you formulate those? what they are, what is it that you're doing? Can you actually say that and describe it? And then ask yourself what your students are doing in your classrooms, does that match? So if we talk about exploration and research and inquiry, well, writing a paper is not necessarily doing that. <laughs> it's the format we are so used to, but is that also the format that you know, supports student learning? So, the point is not that we all become, you know, do medical education here. <laughs> uh, of course we can't. But I think I would like to play the ball out to you. So how do you think about your teaching and your own learning in connection with what you do in your field as a practitioner and what your students are experiencing in your classroom? And how do you juggle that? And how do, you know, so Give us good examples of what you do. And, and by that, I'll turn it over to questions, and hopefully not just questions, but maybe we can ha start a conversation about practicing the humanities and learning in the humanities. 